US job vacancies were weaker than anyone expected in July, boosting chances of a larger cut by the Fed in two weeks' time. Australia's economy expands, although household spending weakens, and China's services sector is soft. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ Senior Commodity Strategist Daniel Hines sets out the challenges OPEC producers are facing from weakening global activity. They'll need to take into consideration not just the slightly weaker demand that's coming through for their oil, but also the much more bearish sort of tone that investors have created. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, the first set of US labour market figures arrived last night and came in weaker than expected. That prompted US Treasury yields to fall 6 to 10 basis points. Traders increased their bets for a 50 basis point rate cut by the Fed in September to 40%. They were at 30%. Job openings, or JOLTS numbers, showed available jobs in the US fell by 200,000 to 7.7 million in July. It's lowest in three years and below all economist forecasts. Here's ANZ head of G3 Economics, Brian Martin. The ratio of job openings to available workers or unemployed people was just above one. It was 1.07 jobs for every unemployed person. That compares with a high just above two job openings for every unemployed person when the Fed started to raise interest rates back in March 2022. The data are consistent with the Fed needing to cut interest rates. We expect that the FOMC will cut rates 25 basis points when they meet in September. The US dollar index was down 0.4% at 4am Sydney Melbourne time. That helped the Aussie dollar. It was up 0.11% at 67.16 US cents. And the Kiwi was up 0.23% at 61.97 US cents. Number two, Australia's economy grew 0.2% in the April to June quarter, in line with market expectations. Annual growth came in at 1%, and it was helped by previous revisions. But as ANZ senior economist Catherine Birch explains, that wasn't too much to write home about. Now, that's the weakest print that we've seen since the early 90s recession, outside of the pandemic, of course. And we saw that GDP per capita fell for the sixth consecutive quarter and for seven of the last eight quarters. Really, what drove the GDP growth this quarter was some strength in the public sector, which added 0.4 percentage points to quarterly growth. Um, We also saw net exports rise by 0.2 percentage points, but there was weakness in the private sector, which subtracted 0.2 percentage points from quarterly growth. Inventories also took some off growth as well. Number three, Catherine says the data is unlikely to shift the Reserve Bank of Australia's thinking on interest rates, despite household spending falling 0.2 percent, which was weaker than the central bank's forecast. In the other data releases since the RBA's August meeting, so labour market and monthly CPI, we've seen employment growth and monthly inflation exceed expectations. So we don't think that this is really going to change the RBA's mind materially, particularly because GDP is a lagged release. This is for Q2, so it covers some of the activity that we were seeing way back in April, but also because if we take a forward-looking perspective, we know that some of those, the stage three tax cuts and cost of living relief measures will help households going forward from Q3. China's services purchase Managers Index fell to 51.6 in August. Now that was below forecasts. ANZ senior China strategist Zhao Pengxing says the result, combined with weak manufacturing data this week, adds downside risk to GDP. So the job show that there is a growing concern over China growth. Probably during the summer holiday, some people expect the service sector could outperform, but the drop in Caixin service PMS suggests that the service sector is spending slower than before. Number five. Prices at New Zealand's regular dairy product auction fell 0.4% yesterday. Now that prompted some weakness in the Kiwi dollar. ANZ senior economist Miles Workman points out that followed a 5.5% increase previously. Under the hood, we had whole milk powder, which is almost, actually slightly more than 50% of our dairy exports. That fell 2.5%. But skim milk powder, which is about a quarter of our dairy exports, lifted 4.5%. So a lot of uh, variance under the hood. Um, but yeah, ultimately netting out with that small contraction in the index. Is this enough to warrant a material rethink in terms of our expectations for the farm gate milk price this year? I think the answer to that question is no, not at this stage. Miles Workman there. 
Now, for our bonus deep dive interview, you'll recall oil prices fell sharply yesterday on concerns US demand could fall more than expected. ANZ Senior Commodity Strategist Daniel Hines spoke to my colleague Alex Tarrant about the challenges OPEC is facing more generally from weaker global demand. We've clearly seen a weakening in demand, most predominantly in, in China. You know, at the start of the year, myself, like a lot of other forecasters, expected uh, Chinese growth to provide uh, the bulk of uh, global growth in demand this year. But we've seen, obviously, some fairly strong economic headwinds really dent that. And our, our last um, update, we reduced our, our growth in demand by about 20% So for, for 24. So it's clearly a weakening sort of demand backdrop. But I think more broadly, OPEC is facing sort of fairly bearish sort of tone across the investment community. This has been driven by the prospect of a rather difficult sort of economic landing, particularly in developed markets, even though you know, we now have the prospect of a rate cut, a relatively aggressive rate cut, I suppose, uh, by the Fed um, over the next uh, little while. But that sort of darkening economic backdrop in developed markets um, is, is certainly creating some concern. And I think when OPEC did propose to phase out its voluntary cuts earlier in the year, we've seen prices actually fall. And I think they'll need to take into consideration not just the slightly weaker demand that's coming through for their oil, but also the much more bearish sort of tone that investors have created and uh, that's obviously weighing on on prices which for them I suppose is ultimately the goal you know these uh, production cuts they implemented were used to stabilize the market and support prices and uh, you know we haven't seen um, that to date so I think uh, you know they'll have to take into consideration market views and at the moment you know if we did see them raise output we'd see a pretty hefty response I suspect and prices would, would definitely come under pressure how much further out, do you think they'll have to push out phasing out those cuts? We'll definitely have to see them push it out into 2025. And I suppose the time around that probably won't be as uh, critical. I, I do think that the um, the commentary they uh, would potentially provide um, you know, would have a bigger say if they're much more open to being flexible and allowing sort of fundamentals to drive those decisions. I think um, you know, the market might be appeased by even a smaller pushback in that phase out of, of production cuts. So, um, But yeah, yeah, certainly, I think as an initial response, I think pushing it out into 2025 should probably appease the market. You mentioned in the note that the market remains sensitive to bearish news, but I guess there's that contrast where we see headlines about jumps in oil prices on geopolitical conflict and things like that. They sort of, I guess they take the daily headlines, but the medium to long term situation is still a bearish move lower. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think uh, when you look into these geopolitical events, the impact that it's having on oil prices, um, at least it's it, the longevity of that impact is, is certainly diminishing. So we see that initial rally, for example, around some sort of disruption and, and Libya is one which stands out at the moment. But the market quickly gets over that and we see not too much uh, later prices back to where they were before the start of that potential or that actual geopolitical event. So yeah, the impact is rather diminishing as a result, I suppose, of this darkening sort of economic backdrop. Daniel Hines there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Thursday, September the 5th. Catch you tomorrow with a look ahead to key US non-farm payrolls figures. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.